This is Interview with an Author. I'm your host, Lee Pafford. At 25 years old, Ashok Rajmani was at the top of his game, climbing the corporate ladder in New York, enjoying himself, ready to take over the world, pretty much invincible. Then the day of his older brother's wedding, he experienced something that changed his life forever, and he tells us about his story in his memoir, The Day My Brain Exploded. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about what exactly happened to you the day of your brother's wedding. Uh, it was 10 minutes before the wedding ceremony. Mm -hmm. I was in my hotel room going around doing my business. Uh, for the explicit details, you can get my book and you can find <laughs> out. Um, but I was doing my stuff and all of a sudden I felt this crippling um, headache that felt like a thunderclap within my skull. Hmm. And it felt like an explosion. It felt like a bomb inside my brain. I quickly called uh, the operator and they brought up my brother and my sister-in-law. Ten minutes before the wedding. Ten Their minutes wedding. Before this, yeah. And um, I'm sure she was in a wedding dress at that point. I don't quite remember. But I think he was dressed up already in his tux. And they zoomed me to the hospital, which luckily was next door. And they discovered that I had a thing called an AVM. Uh, which is an arteriovenous malformation, okay. um, which is a congenital birth defect, which is a, a ticking time bomb literally in your brain. It's a tangle of veins and arteries, like a ball of yarn. 1% mm -hmm. of human beings are born with that. Mm. And the people that are born with it, it might explode, it might not explode. When it does explode, the majority die. So they found out at that time that I did have, and I was born with an AVM, and... Uh, at that point, they didn't know what to do, so we were in a state of shock. What should we do? Do they have the wedding? Do I have, you know, do we stop the wedding? But they went ahead and did the wedding. My mom asked the doctors specifically, can she go for 10 minutes? And they said, he's not going anywhere. So <laughs> That must have been a relief to her. Yes, so 10 minutes, she saw the ceremony and, and ran back. And um, from that day on, it was Alice in Wonderland. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I know that your family had a big part in your recovery process, so tell me a little bit about what happened. You're in the hospital. The wedding's over at this point. All the family has gone back home, and now you are in D.C., correct? Correct. And you're kind of stuck waiting to find out what's going to happen. Correct. So what were your feelings? What, what was your family going through at that point? Well, I was, uh, it was, I was rather unconscious a lot of the time, so I didn't know what was happening. At that time, my father was out on business, and my mother and my brother were the ones that were with me. Mm. And I think it was just a, a situation of touch and go. They were very frightened whether I would live or die. There were moments of severe pain, severe agony, and I would, it looked like I was going to die at that point. But I would survive it. And at one point in the book, uh, I mentioned that I did get struck with the... Uh, Meningitis. I had two, two bouts of meningitis, and that happened. And then I had what's called ventriculostomies, which are little um, tubes that are drilled into your skull, like antlers. Goodness. Right. And they were there to drain out the blood. So I would have these sort of operations where they would drill open my skull, little tiny burr holes, they're called. And they would insert these tubes, these what I call the antlers, mm -hmm. to drain out my blood. And during that time, it was very... Uh, very touch and go, and it lasted for three months until my blood could clot. Okay. And then when it clotted, they were able to drill open my skull completely and scoop out the AVM. But until that point, the blood was, uh, when you have a hemorrhage, the blood goes through your body like a flood all over your body from here to here. And they had to wait until the blood could clot for them to do anything. So unfortunately, in that case, it took three months. So for you, you're saying that you were unconscious for most of that those three months, but your, your mother and your, your brother and your new sister-in-law and father well, were... And I, I babbled quite a bit, and there were moments <laughs> where uh, the doctors consistently told my mom and my brother, always keep talking to him, never stop talking to him to keep him into this world. Luckily, I have a really big mouth, so I kept <laughs> talking, and um, my brother would help out. He would come to the hospital room and sing the Good, Day, Good, Good Times theme song. He would sing Spider-Man. He would sing whatever it took to get me uh, awake, mm -hmm. and I would sing with him. So, uh, yeah, I'm a fan of good times. <laughs> Absolutely. That was nice of him to come out and do that as a newlywed, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it was very taxing for them. But It once... was taxing for my sister-in-law, yeah. Oh, well, I can imagine. I mean, their honeymoon should have been in Barbados, and it was in a, ho a hospital room. 
So what are you going to do? Mm. Yeah. Well, at that point, right, what are you going to do? Absolutely. You have to be there for your family. And That's right. Hopefully they're able to make it up at some point. <laughs> yes. They forgave me. My sister-in-law forgave me. Good. Correct. And once you were released from the hospital, what did that process look like? Now you're done with the hospital. Mm. I assume there's a recovery process. You did write a little bit about your support groups that you attended and some, a lot of physical therapy that you had to go through after the accident. Well, it was a lot, a lot, a lot of therapy. I had uh, physical therapy just to develop my motor skills better. I had visual therapy because I have lost half of my vision uh, with uh, half blindness and I had to relearn how to scan and how to see things. Mm. And um, I had memory issues and part of the uh, therapy for that was to watch game shows. <laughs> so I had to watch Wheel of Fortune, I had to watch Jeopardy, I had to watch the nightly news. At the end of every nightly news I had to go through it and name the different segments of what we learned in the nightly news and that would strengthen my memory. Um, but it was a very long, arduous process, and, f and just the walking itself was very difficult. I had to relearn how to walk. I was, had been sedentary for so long. I had to relearn how to eat as well. And brain injuries are so tricky. I, I have some experience in my personal life with people that I love that have had traumatic brain injuries, and it's amazing that you can still look, and forgive me for saying, normal. Uh, people wouldn't know that anything has happened to you, but there are still a lot of things going on inside. One of the things that you touched on in your book was the fact that being a minority and growing up in, a little bit in the Midwest, I know you are from New Jersey, um, there was a little bit of issue with race and, and some bullying, and now you are no longer the 25-year-old who is immortal. You are now somebody who has suffered this uh, ailment and, and you're building yourself and, and you're, you're attending these support groups. So tell me a little bit about what it was like to try to reinvent yourself and what it was like to go through the, the different support groups and be an outsider in this. Well, the hardest thing I've learned um, with having brain injury is, as they say, it's the invisible condition. Mm -hmm. um, as you'd say, I look normal, quote-unquote. Um, and because of that, people are not aware of the damage within that I'm going through. And that is the same for myself. I will look in the mirror, I'll see the same Ashok, the same who would become 25 years later and, you know, late 30s. And I would say, nothing has happened to you. You're perfectly fine. Why aren't you able to do the tasks that you used to do? And uh, I have to remember to myself that brain injury is within, and it's very difficult. What I learned from a lot of the groups Many people just look perfectly fine and, and dandy, but they're going through so much trouble. They're going through so many memory problems, so many cognitive issues. But it's impossible to really get to the grips of that because they look on the outside fine. One of the stories that you wrote about in the book was when you got to the point where you were at a recovery uh, stage that you could go back to work. So mm -hmm. you went back to the PR firm mm -hmm. and you sat down and you had a meeting with a new client. Can you share us? the story with that? Well, as I had said earlier, part of my brain injury has cost me my vision, one of the consequences. It's an ailment called hemianopsia, and it's uh, a cutting of your vision because, um, so now I cannot see the left side. However, it's very hard to realize it because I can intellectualize it, but to know it on a daily basis, I forget because there's no black line. For instance, looking at you, Lee, all I can see is half your face, mm -hmm. but you can't tell looking at me. So at work, I wasn't understanding about my blindness. So I would see um, maybe a status report and I would yell and I would talk to clients and I would you know, be very temperamental if I couldn't see them, if I couldn't remember things. And I didn't realize at that point how much therapy I still needed to go through. Um, in PR, you meet your clients and each client you have to have a project with, you have to uh, learn to promote them. And one of the clients, I was very unprofessional. Uh, I don't even remember what I said, but I said things that uh, a PR person shouldn't have said. Um, might have been profanity. I don't remember, but I was fired then and there from that client, and I realized this isn't working for me, and I quit immediately. Mm -hmm. I can imagine there was a lot of frustration. One of the other stories that you shared was the loss of direction. You weren't able to go to places. You, you spoke about a friend in the book where you were trying to walk to a park, if I remember correctly, and you just walked around. You couldn't find where the park was. So you have all this frustration brewing inside of you. And from what I remember, you may have taken a little bit of it out on some of your family members. Um, can you tell us about that? Um, yeah, I mean, 
when you have a birth defect and when it explodes like this, you don't know who to take it out on because uh, at first you want to take it out on yourself and realize you did something. But after a certain point, you, you haven't done anything. So you, got to, you have to take out your anger on the people closest to you. So I took it out on my brother because I was envious of how his life had gone on and how he never had a birth defect and how you know things were looking well. I was angry with my father because I felt that he hadn't been supportive enough to what we were going through. And I was the worst of it all was I was angry to my mother because I somehow um, abused her for having this birth defect because it was congenital. And I said some horrible things about uh, her and her uterus and things like that. So I would take out a lot of my animosity on my parents and my brother. How did that affect your relationship? At the time, it was... It was very, very um, uh, confusing because they were angry, they were upset, but they understood. But in the long run, it tightened it and it deepened every, everything because for um, this kind of grievance to be taken out on these people, knowing fully well what had gone through me, there was a connection and a tightness that I didn't even know we had. My brother and I became Thelma and Louise, so <laughs> yeah, I have a relationship with him I never had. So they don't harbor any resentment towards you. It, does it come up as like a joking thing? It's a holiday time. Well, I, I do feel horrible for any mother who has um, given birth to a child with a birth defect because in addition to getting anger from the child, they feel so much guilt. Mm -hmm. My mother went through so much guilt feeling that she caused it and she was um, dealing with so many issues. And many doctors had to say it wasn't your fault birth defects just happen and they mm -hmm. just happen so um, I think the person who had to deal with the worst was my mother and she had to contend with the fact that she had no, nothing to feel guilty about mm. did she have any support from your doctors or from any groups that helped her through this that's a very good question Lee I really wish she did she didn't mm. so it sounds like that might be something to look into in the future, the community can set up perhaps something that can help family members who are dealing with the consequences of someone who's had a traumatic brain injury. Absolutely. That sounds like something that would be a positive step moving forward. Um, one of the things that you shared in the book, you talked a little bit about how you had to write and you had to talk as part of your physical therapy and it led you to writing this book. Were you creative at all before you had the aneurysm? Oh yeah, I was, I was um, absolutely, I, w I wrote a lot. I am a visual artist, I'm a painter and I draw and uh, I create the art, that art that way. However, the difference is before I was in the world of public relations, I was in a sort of media journalist world where I would go around babysitting celebrities and say, look, there's Access Hollywood, there's Entertainment Tonight. And all of these things made it impossible for me to focus on my creati creativity because of what happened and because I've gotten out of PR, I've been able to focus on my writing and my art and to create this book. Mm -hmm. And I, I never would have thought I would create an entire book like this. So. And putting this book together, we already talked about a little bit about how you really are sharing some very intimate details of your life and not just your life, but the members of your family and their reactions to the story. Um, what has this done for you? Has it been therapeutic at all to put this book together? Um, I would like to say it has, but it really hasn't. It opens up a lot of uh, old wounds. Mm -hmm. It's not about catharsis for me. It's about helping others. And um, as I was writing, there was an expectation that I would finally find some relief, some emotional relief. But it wasn't in a, in a way. It was uh, to revisit a very cruel part of your life is not that easy. The, the one thing that kept me going was that I was able to document an experience that few brain injured survivors have the capacity to, to do and I was able to articulate it and document it and I felt I had a duty to do that for my brain injured community. Have people come up to you since the book? I know you've been doing a lot of readings and bookstores and a lot of press. Have people come up to you and shared their experiences with you? Yeah, many people. I think the coolest part is I'm getting emails from people across the world from different countries who've read my book, who have been, uh, who had said, thank you for writing this because I couldn't write this, and thank you for explaining an experience I couldn't. My book also deals with um, my journeys through epilepsy. A lot of people with epilepsy are not able to discuss or to deal with uh, their seizures, especially little children. They're not able to articulate or voice what happened to them. So I'm, able, I'm very happy that I'm able to discuss the epilepsy as well. 
And you, in the book, there's a scene where you are talking to a mother in a park, and her son also had AVM, and you felt such a strong connection to that person. You mentioned it only happens to 1% of the people, and most people end up perishing because of the AVM. Uh, so you must feel like you have a really strong community. How many people have you been able to meet through your interactions that have had the same condition that you had? I haven't met a lot of people. I think what has brought me closer to the community is Facebook and social media, actually. Uh, through Facebook, I have joined organizations for AVM and AVM awareness, and I've met other people that have had this, and it's very fascinating because when you have an AVM, it's such a rare condition that there are few people that can understand, but luckily, through the internet, I've met a lot. Mm -hmm. And. Is this something that you need to worry about if you did plan on having children at some point in time? Is this something that you can get tested for or is this something that, that you would have to be concerned might be passed along to the next generation? Very good question again. I did ask the doctors afterwards. I was so terrified, but they have told me it's a congenital defect, not genetic. Okay. So I can have children. I don't really have to have fear about that. Um, yeah, it is congenital, and when it is congenital defect, you, you don't have to have worry to about do. it. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm sure it was a relief for your brother and your sister-in-law as well to hear that. Absolutely. The thing that struck me in the book was just the raw emotion that you shared, and to be someone who thankfully has not had to endure something like that, to read about you waking up and being covered in blood and feces and not understanding what exactly has happened to you and these moments of fear when something happens and you're not really sure what your body's reacting to or what it's doing. Um, it was frightening. Do you still have to go through moments like that now, 10 years after the incident? Actually, I do. Whenever I think I've, um, I guess, outgrown it to a certain degree, I really haven't. And I think mm -hmm. that's true for a lot of brain injury survivors that no matter what for the rest of your life, you're going to be attacked um, uh, in your brain. You're going to feel uh, you're going to feel that you've never really, really gotten over it. And I, I don't think I ever will. I think uh, you can make you can move on, but I can never really forget what happened to me. Is it something that's easy to accept at this point in your recovery process? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's still something that is upsetting, but it's something that you accept. You realize it's like having black hair or brown eyes that this was just a part of you and mm -hmm. it ha happened. I think a lot of it has to do with me being Hindu too. The belief in karma has played a lot into it, the concept of what goes around comes around and um, things are going to be what they are. Uh, you, can't, you can't question a lot of things. What was going to be, it was going to be. So you don't ever have moments where you think back and, and wonder what it might have been like, what your life would have been like if you hadn't had this? Um, well, I don't know. I think this might have worked out for the best because at that time, because of a sort of fast life I was living, um, it was um, not a quality life. I think I was making a lot. I was doing this and that. I was very busy. But there wasn't the quality of life that I'm experiencing now with my book and with my art that I had not, I, I was not doing that before. Mm -hmm. I see. And what else can we expect from you? Well, my follow-up book is called um, If These Saris Could Talk, and it's a fun and frothy book, uh, a collection of zany stories of the crazy women in my life in India. So it has the same dark comedy as uh, The Day My Brain Exploded, but there's no brain hemorrhage. When is that coming out? Uh, hopefully next year sometime. Oh, that sounds good. And I understand that we may be privileged to see um, a motion picture in the future of this book. Yes, that is correct. That should be very exciting for I'm you. Very excited. And if you have an idea as to who should play me, I would really love to know. Hmm. If your viewers could as well. I would love to, <laughs> we'll have to, I would put, love to know. We'll have to put that up on our Facebook page uh, and see if we can uh, take a poll. That would be great. That's really exciting to try to find someone to play you. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Is your brother and your sister-in-law going to pick somebody out as well? I, yes. <laughs> Not that your wishes will be granted. I think but. he wants Brad Pitt. So, but, oh. yeah. <laughs> well, that seems very reasonable. Absolutely. I'm Let's sure tan he's him attractive. and we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And what do your parents think about what's come out from this book? You know, their experiences are now shared with the world. You're saying that there yeah. are people all over the world reading this book. What is their I'm telling you, families reaction? of memoirists are the bravest human beings in the world because be. when you're related to a memoirist, everything you've done is an open book, no pun intended. And um, 
I think they were a bit squeamish about some of the stuff. They were a bit aggravated that I'd revealed a bit of stuff. Really? But, yeah, but overall they were so proud of me for documenting this. And mm -hmm. I think uh, I did give it to them uh, as a Christmas gift, and they were so proud and they were happy, and I, I was very moved. Was that the first time they had seen the manuscript is when you gave it to them for Christmas? Or? Yeah, the, the final book. Oh, mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. So you didn't share any of the details beforehand? They didn't know the, the manuscript, no. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, the, our audience will have to pick up the book and read it because there's a lot of stuff in here that I'm not sure I would want my brother to be sharing. <laughs> well, and the, the main point is that it's written in a com comedic vein. And a lot of, I call it the anti-Oprah memoir because a lot of medical memoirs are schmaltzy and sentimental. This isn't. This is funny. Yeah, it's very funny. And I felt mm -hmm. when I was reading it like I was talking to a friend. Like I was, I was listening to a friend relay um, you know, this event that happened to them and how it changed their life and kind of like I was on the phone talking to you, hearing about what your mother thought and, you know, why did your dad do what he did and, and mm -hmm. yeah, why didn't it happen to your brother? Why did it have to happen to you? So I thought that that was really great that you were able to use that tone when you were writing the book. Mm -hmm. Did at any point in time you think to yourself, maybe I should t talk a little bit more about medically what it is or maybe I should kind of um, bring it down to a more sentimental level or you always wanted to go with this style? I did because I think I like to, uh, I like the conflation of the personal and the universal. And I like the concept that you know, this is a very personal story. Few pe and few people can understand having a time bomb in your brain. Mm. And if you can, God bless you because I don't know, it's very difficult. So few people can understand that, but everyone understands the issue of survival. Everyone understands the issue of challenges and overcoming them. So um, that is my book. It has a sort of there's personal elements, but it's a universal story. And as a universal story, I also want to make it funny. I want to make people know that just because you're ill and just because you're going through challenges doesn't mean you lose your sense of humor. Well, you certainly didn't in this book, I have Thank to you. say. It was very funny, and I'm looking forward to uh, once you know, along the process, the movie's release, going out to see that as well. It'll be interesting to see how, how they put that through. Are you going to have any part in putting together the screenplay for the movie? Oh, I have no clue right now. I, at this We're at point, the very it's preliminary so stages, I Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I have no idea. That's okay. Well, <laughs> hopefully you will. You'll have a little bit. I can't imagine someone would be able to relay the same kind of raw emotion and, and still make it funny uh, and still real. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you, you don't want... It's, it's interesting the way that you put the story together because it is funny, but it's, it's not humorous funny. It's, it's and like it's a said, personal it's a story. Right. It's a memoir. So, yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, let me ask you this because I do the, the Lee's Library List segments. What are you reading now? Oh, my God. I'm actually rereading some old books because it, it stimulates my mind. And one of the books that I'm rereading, which brings me a lot of joy, is called Geek Love. And that was by Catherine Dunn, and it was a 1980s novel about a carnival freak family. <laughs> and I relate to it now because it's a story of these children that are born with all defects and how this family has to bond together to make it through. And that's my experience. We're a carnival freak show family <laughs> making it through. So, yeah, I, I've been rereading that. And when did you first read it? Was it before or after? I first read it before um, my hemorrhage. So... Um, probably when I was 18. So a lot more relatable or? or... Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, I related to the fact that we are always a crackpot family. We're always a weirdo <laughs> family. But now that there are literal birth defects in our family, it just makes it more it's enjoyable. A lot <laughs> no, yeah. And if the audience wants to go out and get your book, where could they find it other than, of course, the library? In all bookstores, everywhere, in Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Indies, every, every place you want to go. To get bookstores or to get books, you can get it. And you are doing some in-store readings at different places, so we'll be sure to make sure our viewers can see your website so they can come out and find you. And you now, although you were from New Jersey originally, you're in New York. So do you find? I was in New Jersey for approximately a month when I was born, and then I after uh, for just what? a little bit, and then I was raised in the Midwest. Once you were born in New Jersey, <laughs> I'm a Jersey boy. You're always a Jersey boy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, goodness. you're you're a New Jersey boy. Do you see that I'm ashamed already? <laughs> No, but, who would be? No, no New I'm great. a Midwesterner, I, but I'm a Midwesterner through and through. And yeah, I feel, it's just interesting. I've been in New York for over 20 years, but I'll always feel like a, a brown redneck, a nice <laughs> a hick, and proud of it. I'm a proud, you know, Hindu hick. A proud Hindu hick. Absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> now living in New York, do you think that it's a little bit easier for you to be living in a big city 
as opposed to living in the suburbs and having to drive and maybe would you be a little more reliant on Oh, I thought you meant because care? of my ethnicity. Um, yeah. Well, that on too, a, I'm sure. On a, on a practical level, absolutely, because I'm not able to drive because of my blindness. Okay. Um, here we have public transportation and we, you know, have city streets. The only problem is, is that um, you hit a lot of people and New Yorkers are not happy people. If you bump into them, <laughs> they'll try to beat you up. So I have to be very wary of, of the way I'm walking because I can't see, so I'll, I'll end up hitting people. But overall, I'm very pleased to be in New York. And I'm proud to be born in New Jersey, born, okay? Born, not raised, but born, born in New Jersey. Yes. That's all it takes. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank I you really for appreciate me. it. And we are going to um, go ahead and run a clip of a little portion of the book. And uh, thank you so much for coming out. And I hope you have much success in your book and any further endeavors that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you. The first part that I'm reading delves specifically into the mind of the brain injured person and it deals with the hallucinations and visions one experiences while in the hospital room. Um, this section is called The Hallucinations and the Liquid Afterlife. I died for your sins. I am the body of love. Find salvation through my pain. These words, of course, connect to Christ, but for some reason I yelled them while in the hospital and I'm not any shade of Christian. They broke loose as my mind unleashed a torrent of fictions, all of which at the time I deeply, desperately believed. My savior complex, I later found, was a textbook reaction. Many brain patients, especially those surviving a hemorrhage, aneurysm, or stroke, don't question the veracity of their hallucinations. My imaginary beliefs were far from imaginary to me. The Christ incarnation was just one of my many guises as my brain continued to bleed. The surgeons patiently waited for a clot to form so they could begin planning for the craniotomy. While they were waiting to open the jar that was my skull, my mind kept on chugging. I suffered a form of mind rape. My thoughts and feelings were presented nakedly, vulnerably to the world. With my brain torn and bloody, my superego had vanished. Without mental inhibition, my entire inner world, once a lush, fenced garden, had been violently laid open. I never shut up. Sometimes the words were co coherent, sometimes not. The doctors told my family to be prepared for my shifting intellect, saying that brain injury patients travel in and out of lucidity, swimming in and out of consciousness on a daily basis. Through my incessant yelping, I was able to convey what I was feeling and seeing primarily my hallucinations. So for three months, I remained in that state, existing not only in the quiet world of the hospital, but also in the deep, dark world of my mind. Days bled into nights, nights into weeks. I lost track of time while my entire world lay in my skull. The hospital staff would continually ask what day and hour it was. But sometimes I knew, sometimes I didn't. It was often impossible to figure out. Even surrounded by people, mine was a world of maddening solitude and darkness. The nightmare played neatly off my massive messiah complex, looking at and experiencing the violence done to my body. I had no choice but to deify the pain, to make it holy. I felt the sharp, intrusive needles stabbing me, and I felt the metal tubes drilling into my skull and I felt the restraint strangling my hands and arms, and I felt the injections on my feet to prevent clotting. Since my pain was so intense, I decided it must be virtuous. I later understood that technology had saved me, but at the time I felt as if these were instruments to my destruction. As I underwent the incessant physical cruelty, my mind provided its own escape. My hallucinations were my only way out. When the pain grew too intense, Ashok as Christ emerged. When I watched my family members, all sitting in chairs, their faces wearing looks of deep agony and despair, I realized I had to save them. Thank you for watching. This is Lee Pafford for Hometown TV. Please stay tuned for more interesting topics and programs from your community.